I'm one of the members here to the Guild, and I just wanted to uh, brief everybody on the uh, reception for today. Uh, we have uh, this month's artist, Joyce Wasserman, um, who comes to us from uh, Manalapan. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, I didn't know how to And I wanted to just kind of give everybody a little a brief history of the Guild. The uh, Ocean County Artist Guild has been here for many years, um, probably as far as the 1950s, and it's a um, nonprofit organization that promotes um, the arts in the Ocean County um, area, and um, it gives um, the artists opportunity, the local artists opportunity to be able to um, showcase their art. So every month the guild um, has different artists in uh, that exhibit their artwork and you know um, that way uh, it just keeps the the guild um, busy and it gives everybody the opportunity obviously to showcase their art. Um, before I turn you over to Joyce so she can explain uh, the different uh, process and procedures for her art and her paintings uh, next door is Suzanne, which also has an exhibit going on, and she is um, also going to just be giving a few um, demos on her one of the processes, which is called the uh, the egg tempera. And before that, she's going to be talking about that you know that specific process. So now I'm going to turn you over to Joyce, which is uh, the artist of the month. First, I wanted to say thank you to the Guild for allowing me to exhibit my art here today. It really means a lot to me. And Louis has been such a tremendous help um, with getting the whole process together, which you know can be a little daunting when you've never done it before. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now that I've done it, I can check it off my bucket list. <laughs> and um, no, I'm happy to be here. It's a beautiful town. and. The guild seems to have so much um, influence on the community, so it's it's you know a really honor. Um, but you know, with that, you know my my art is something that I do as a hobby. It's not a career. It I'd love to have more time to do it, but I still have a regular day job, and this is something that I started. Actually, when I was young, I loved to paint. I loved to draw, and then I took a lot of classes in college. My parents were not thrilled that I wanted to get um, a degree, and I decided to go more towards the business end of my fur career and let it go when I had my family raising my kids and about eight, nine years ago, did a Pinot's palette paint and wine right. class and said, oh, you know, I have more time now. I can do this. I'd like to do this, not just, you know, be taught, not just you know, as a Pinot's palette painter, but in a class. So I took a class in Freehold and, you know, it, it expanded from there. Um, and I started painting at the class and I set up a studio at home, um, learned a process um, through my art school on, um, you know, working from back to front is really my, you know, the way I do my paintings. If you look at the art, you know, anything you see in the background is where I start and I kind of move forward mm -hmm. with that. So, you know, the stuff, the, the, the art that pops out is probably the last thing that I'll do on a painting. Um, then I, you know, kind of go over it again and again and fuss with it until finally I'm like, enough. <laughs> Otherwise you can lose yourself in it. And mm -hmm. Louie and I talked about this, yeah. how, you know, when you get in a bigger painting, you kind of just get lost and you can just keep going back. So sometimes the, the smaller ones are more, um, more gratifying mm -hmm. because they're done quickly oh not even so quickly but there's just not as much surface area so you don't start getting yourself too um confused mm -hmm. with it um so you know my inspiration for the art is you know a lot of travel that i've done taken pictures and use those for um you know the, the photos so that one up there the the bird i just took a couple months ago i was visiting my mom in florida and uh that was a bird on the beach and i just thought it was really pretty and wanted to have it for the show and 
then um, you know travels to uh, Europe. I was in Amsterdam, and these two pictures, these two paintings, were taken the same day on a tour outside of um, uh, this the city center in Amsterdam. So you know, what you know, you'd be interested in knowing where those came from. And you know, this is Florida. A lot of travels to Florida for my family, but yeah, that's that's my art. And thank you very much for joining us here today. I appreciate your support of the thank you gallery. Thank you. Beautiful. Before we start, I just wanted to mention that I forgot to mention about the raffles that I have here. Uh, they're ten dollars a piece, and they're uh, going toward the guild. And um, only five hundred. The drawing is. Um, September 24th. September 24th is the drawing, and they're ten dollars a piece. Right. Okay. So if you're, anybody is interested, please come and see me. Or um, is there somebody else that has them? Kathy, Kathy, Kathy the has them over there. Yeah. Okay. In the uh, other room. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Excuse me. Hi everybody, my name is Francine Van Austrian. I've been a member of the Guild for like forever. Uh, I'm a curator um, here, uh, so I work with the gallery committee and every year we each do two um, artists to curate. I was lucky enough to um, have Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne, and, um, Suzanne does wonderful icons. I just met her and her husband George this week and um, we had a, a nice time hanging all this gorgeous work. Now, this work, Suzanne's going to explain um, how she does it. She's, and you know, a little bit about herself. And also, um, we're gonna have an egg tempered uh, demo, which is going to be in the other room after Su Studio. Suzanne talks, because she needs a little more room. So when we're done, if you just follow us into the other room, um, Suzanne will do a demo. And here she is, our wonderful artist, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, I think the first thing I want to say about what I do is that it is quite different traditionally from what most of the people who exhibit here do because the emphasis in iconography is definitely not on individual creativity. Um, it's a tradition and you work within a tradition when you're doing icons. Um, it has some boundaries, like haiku poetry has boundaries, sonnets have boundaries, um, and it's musically, it's probably similar to chant, um, Gregorian, there's a lot of different kinds of chants, and we're probably most familiar with Gregorian chant. So, um, when I started learning about this, and from an Episcopal priest on Staten Island, um, he told me that, you know, you have to follow the rules. He said, but you will discover as you learn more about it that there is room for you within those rules. And I think that's true because um, someone, I was following something on Facebook and someone posted one of my icons and then someone commented, is that Suzanne's? It looks like Suzanne. So there, there is individuality within each person's work as an iconographer, but you do follow certain rules. And I've been explaining some of those rules to people who have asked me. And um, one of the ones people seem fascinated with is, okay, I can show you on like this, this one. And if you look around, many of them have halos that go up above a border. Well, the tradition in iconography is that the area inside the border is the world, but the world cannot contain the glory of the holiness that you're depicting. So it bursts out the borders. So that, that's why you see that on all icons, many, many icons, not all of them, there's a few exceptions, but um, that's one of the traditional things that you work with, concepts like that. Um, icons are about scripture. They're, they're part of a Christian tradition. Um, artistically, they're probably, were originally re related to the Fayum um, uh, mummy portraits from Fayum in Egypt. 
um, which were did, were going on about the same time that Byzantine icons were developed. And I was just reading about them last night to make sure I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> and apparently, they feel that there was a lot of panel painting going on in, the, say, the four and five hundreds, because the earliest icons that exist happen to have been preserved at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And the only reason they survived, because there was an ant, uh, they, I, um, the icon controversy in the 8th and 9th centuries when so many icons were destroyed and iconographers were uh, killed. They, the iconoclast controversy because St. Catherine's at that time was ruled by the Muslims and they were tolerant. I mean, even what we think of them today is not tolerant, but they were quite tolerant. Um, as long as, you know, you did, you obeyed the laws of the land. Um, they allowed, and they still do. St. Catherine's is an interesting place because it has existed all these years in a Muslim country. Mm -hmm. um, and even the really cr crazy, um, ultra-conservative uh, Muslim groups that are around them don't seem to be willing to attack St. Catherine's. Yeah, so not. a lot of the images you see here go back to the beginning. They're passed along generation to generation with slight differences, um, perhaps in composition. I, I know the, the one directly across from me, which is a, an icon, uh, the round one of Mary, and at, um, within her uh, middle is an icon of Jesus. It's called the Virgin of the Sign, and um, it's a very traditional icon. Mary has her hands up. This is a traditional prayer position, which you see in the paintings in the catacombs. And if you look at a priest in any of the liturgical churches, um, they're, they're often like this at the altar. This is a prayer position. So Mary, it's Mary being a priest from way back when, um, which I used to love to point out to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before we had priests in the, I'm an Episcopalian, we have women priests. Um, but those images are from the catacombs. And they're images of, of not just Mary, there's uh, Priscilla maybe? Uh, there's another woman also who's in this leadership prayer position. Hmm. But framing it the way, composing it the way I did, I did make changes in it by putting it in a circle, by having it surrounded by um, the cherubim and the seraphim. Uh, which is what is surrounding her. The little angel things, mm -hmm. that's what they are. Um, and that's also part of the tradition, seraphim and cherubim. Um, so each of these icons has something in it that goes back to the beginning, except the one of Sojourner Truth. Because she's a late um, 1800s or a figure in the women's suffrage movement and um, equal rights movement too, really. Um, I have sort of taken it upon myself to do icons of women on our calendar of saints because when I first noticed our calendar of saints, it was quite lopsided in the way of the male part of the, mm -hmm. of the population, so I decided I'd do icons of the women. Uh, so that's one of many that I've done of various different women. Um, the Episcopal Church, I do have to say, has added to the women on the calendar of saints quite extensively in the past 20 years, so I'm happier now than I was then. Um, Name some others. Pardon me? Uh, what other women? Oh, you're putting her on the spot. <laughs> I, I did Florence Nightingale. Oh, I did Evelyn Underhill. Um, I did um, Hilda Whitby. I did Julian of Norwich. I did, some of them are on our calendar. Um, I think Julian and Tilda are. And St. Margaret of Scotland, I did that. And she's on our calendar. Well, I started just planning to do the ones on our calendar. And our calendar has expanded. So, um, um, Anna Julia Cooper is one of the newer ones that I did. Um, 
We can talk about it later. I can see Mother Teresa in here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, she's not, she's, I don't think she's on our calendar not, yet, but, she, the if she's not, but, the Roman but you know what, if she, if she might yeah. become on it. But I, I do want to say I work in egg tempera, and to do, and to, first of all, to use egg tempera, you have to use a um, hard surface. You can't do it on canvas, it would just all crack. And, oh. um, would, you, would you talk about that, the, your, your surfaces? Because yes, the surfaces I, are surprised. wood. Uh, you work on wood, um, and not flimsy wood either. And um, it doesn't, it can be flat or it can have that dip in it, which the Russian name for that is the Kovchak. And I don't know another name for it, so I usually call it that. But, a dip um, in the wood surface, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, it's okay. routed out. Oh. So you start with a piece of wood and then you put a coat of rat. Here's the process: a coat of rabbit skin glue, and then you take a piece of linen, very very fine sheer linen, dip it in rabbit skin glue and spread it over that. You let that dry. I think I haven't done this for a while. I. I usually buy them already gessoed at this point. It's a pain. Yeah. And then you put about 10 coats of gesso. Oh my God. And, oh my and God. then at the very end, then you have to sand it down so it's almost marble-like. And it, you use traditional gesso. It's not acrylic gesso. It's, um, it's marble chalk. dust, chalk, and uh, rabbit skin glue. Mm. And you have to keep it warm while you're doing it because the glue uh, has to be warm to be uh, liquid. And then, then you're ready to do the, uh, Im put the image on it, you draw the image on it, however you're gonna transfer the image. Um, if you have noticed in some of the medieval paintings in the museums in New York, if you look closely in the right light, you can see that there's an indentation where the drawing was. And uh -huh. some icons are like that too, that it, um, you etch the image into the surface so that you don't you lose um, some of the finer points of it because traditionally in iconography, especially like on the skin, you put the darkest colors down first. So the skin could be, and you'll see this again if you look at the little paintings at the museum. So you work from Green. behind up toward the front, like yes. the other featured artists today. That's sort of interesting. Yes, you, you, you do you the, dark, the darkest and you build lights yes. uh -huh. uh, to get the final product is basically how you do it. So you're always moving up and towards the light. Mm -hmm. So it's symbolic. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a technique of, of working with egg tempera. Um, and even, it's interesting, I took a, a class with a man who doesn't do icons, but he works in egg tempera, and he, he painted his, um, he, he did gorgeous um, paintings of young women, beautiful young women, and using gold leaf. And he also does beautiful things in flowers.